Okay, I would like to welcome everyone to the University of Central Arkansas Society of Physics Students 2015-2016 seminar series. This seminar is uh, sponsored by the Department of Physics and Astronomy and a grant from the University of Central Arkansas Foundation. Uh, my information is there at the bottom. You can find me on Twitter or via email. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Helen Maynard Casely. She is from, let me see here, I'm going to find my piece of paper. Uh, she did her undergraduate degree um, at University College. I think that says you got your Master of Planetary Science there. Uh, and then yep. you went on and got your PhD in high energy, uh, high pressure physics. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2009, at the University of Eden Edinburgh, uh, she went on to do a postdoc at uh, that same university, and then has transferred over to um, the Bragg Institute at the Australian Nuclear Science uh, Technology Organization in Australia. And we're very happy to have her giving us a seminar today on out of this world crystallography. Thank you very much, and take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, in the future, as it were. That's <laughs> great. All right. Now you guys are going to see yourselves. Um, let me get this going. Okay, cool. I want to say allow. Brilliant. Okay, so here's my presentation. So, um, I'm not sure how much of you guys know about crystallography, so um, I'm sort of going to take you through a journey of crystallography. We're going to start um, talking a little bit about how it's um, how it developed, and it's put a bit a little bit in the Australian context, and you'll see why. Um, but um, it's it's a it's a science that is very old um, as a as a technique. We've been going about 100 years or so since uh, Max von Laue famously took the first diffraction pattern of copper sulfate crystals. Um, so he took this, so he put x-rays, or the, at the time they were the newfangled rotogen rays, and he shined them through a crystal and he got these spots coming off. And he realized that those spots were telling him something about the atomic range, arrangement within the material. He actually found it really difficult to work out that atomic arrangement and it turns out that copper sulfate isn't the simplest crystal structure, it's actually quite a complicated one. So there was actually an alternative team called um, William uh, Lawrence Bragg and William Henry Bragg, they were a father, uh, son and father team and they um, did something similar but they used salt which turned out to be a much simpler crystal structure and so they could work out how to use x-rays and then later other energies um, to, and, and radiation to find exactly where, where atoms are in materials. Now um, that's it's a technique that's now used by um, I would say pretty much all sciences um, but its application in planetary science to date has been uh, I'd say relatively limited. Like we we know what the Earth, and hopefully I'll tell you a little bit about what Earth and the terrestrial planets are are made out of. But now crystallography is really helping us find out what those minerals, what 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 actually makes up those planets um, further out in the solar system. So I'm going to start right at the beginning. Sort of what is the solar system actually made out of? Um, so if you take the Sun out of the equation. Because um, if you'd left it in, <laughs> there'd be a lot more hydrogen and helium. This is what you've got left, and this is the each of the elements in the periodic table scaled to their abundance within the solar system. And um, uh, I, I sometimes get a little bit frustrated by astronomers. I mean, I, I, I love astronomy; it's a really interesting subject. But it's the way that everything beyond helium is called metals. <laughs> <laughs> It seems very dismissive because, as, as you can see, there is, um, well, admittedly, taking out the big source of he hydrogen and helium, there is a lot of other stuff. And it's all this other stuff, this, the carbon, this aluminium, the silicon, that we walk on, that we interact with every day, that's in our iPhones and, and is the stuff that we actually use and is a little bit more tangible to us. So um, in that case, you could call me a meta metallurgist, but <laughs> I, I'd rather just... Um, just to make the point, there's um, a lot of, of other stuff out there. Um, and you can see that the, the elements um, that, that, 
that dominate change as you go through the solar system. So on, on Earth and uh, our terrestrial neighbours, so Mercury, Venus and Mars, we're very much made out of metals. Hang on if, oh yes, you can probably see the screen, so that's very sort of metals and silicates. But as you can see, there's a lot of other stuff there that, that, that is, some of it's locked up in our interior, some of it's in our atmosphere, sort of lighter elements. But as you go further out in the solar system, these lighter elements, um, incorporating a bit of hydrogen, so to make ice, become much, much more important. And um, and that's what I'll be sort of introducing a little bit today. So um, we'll start in Australia because it's, uh, it's, it's where I am. And um, we'll also start with those two gentlemen that I mentioned earlier on. So um, William uh, Henry Bragg, who was the father, and William Lawrence Bragg. So actually, they, they were both British, but um, William Henry Bragg had moved out to Adelaide to take up a professorship of physics. I think he was about 25 when he moved out, so it was quite a big, big role. Um, and uh, William Lawrence Bragg was um, one of his sons, um, was born there, born in Adelaide and grew up in the area. But um, when William Lawrence got to university age, in fact, he did his first degree at University of Adelaide before he was 20, or in fact, actually, maybe before he was 18. He was quite a prodigy. Yeah, and then he moved to um, Cambridge and the whole family moved back to the UK at the same time. So he did a second degree at Cambridge. And it was while he was an undergrad at Cambridge that he put down the, the fundamentals of, of crystallography of diffraction experiments that we do today. So essentially what I do is very say, very similar to what um, both uh, the Bragg sort of and, and Lowy had worked out before. We take a source, so they had used an x-ray tube, and you try and make that source into a beam, if you possibly can, and then you um, shine it a crystal and you get a pattern off. And from that pattern, it was actually um, the younger, the son, um, Lawrence Bragg, who'd made that, that crucial step as to how to um, interpret those diffraction patterns. It's, um, the basis of it is a law that's known as Bragg's Law now. And for this, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1915. Um, and at that point, Lawrence Bragg was only 25. So he's still the youngest recipient of a Nobel Prize in Physics. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. <laughs> So it's sort of a bit of an Australian story, but of course now, 100 years later, we've got um, some much brighter sources for doing this sorts of work. And the, the brighter the source means that you can change around and, and do slightly more detailed work than just looking at salt, which is what they had looked at originally. And so there are um, uh, sort of synchrotron facilities, for instance, up and down uh, across the world. In in the States, for instance, you have the um, advanced light source at Berkeley, you have the advanced photon source, which is uh, near Chicago, and you have the new um, national light source um, Two, I think it's called, um, over in Brookhaven. So, you know, these are these are world leading laboratories, and we have our own one here in Australia. It's down in Melbourne, down at the bottom here. Um, and then, so you use these synchrotrons to generate very high energy and uh, bright sources of X-rays, and so they're, they're sort of absolutely amazing for looking at really big details. And then, um, alternatively, you don't you don't just diffract with X-rays. You can actually diffract with any wavelet, any radiation that has a wavelength around the distance of the of distance between atoms and crystals. So the whole idea is that's how you interact with the material. So for instance, thermal neutrons, and that's uh, where I'm now based here up near Sydney. So Sydney's over here. Um, and uh, those thermal neutrons come from a nuclear reactor. And again, uh, again in, in America, you also have a number of these sources. But you can also um, diffract with electrons as well. And so you get these very beautiful electron diffraction patterns. Now, each of those techniques, the x-rays, the neutrons, and the electrons, are really useful for different materials. For instance, the electrons don't penetrate very far, but they're really good for surfaces. Neutrons are excellent at seeing hydrogen atoms. So that's why they're particularly useful for what I'm doing. And, uh, and then x-rays are just amazingly bright, so you can um, you can really uh, look for details in the in the tiniest of samples. So that's just gives you a bit of a background on the methods, and uh, I'll sort of show you a little bit how these one of these instruments works. So this is um, one of the instruments here. It's called a kidna, 
They're all named after Australian animals, which is a little bit embarrassing. So you have a, a beam of neutrons, and they're all, all wavelengths, and then they get to a monochromator, which is a, a big single crystal, and that just picks one particular wavelength. We can actually adjust the instrument to pick the right wavelength for the sample. And then it interacts with the sample, and then you get this sort of beautiful diffraction pattern. This, this animation sort of falls down a little bit because the diffraction patterns are usually a little bit more detailed than this. And that's what we're recording on that detector. And uh, I like to say that this, this woman was modeled on me. <laughs> so, and then, as you see, glamorous scientists like myself um, are able to use those diffraction patterns to work out exactly where the materials are, uh, atoms are within your material. And as you can imagine, that's useful not just for for, for the planetary science that I'm using. Um, we have a lot of battery work. For instance, they can see how. Um, how uh, atoms are being moved as the uh, charge, as the material is charged and discharged, and so helpfully, um, it was all part of designing better batteries for the future. Um, for another good um, thing is looking for potential materials to store gases, so hydrogen storage. Again, if you remember what I said, that neutrons are particularly good at foreseeing hydrogen, and so that's what one of the reasons why neutron diffraction has become incredibly important. But I don't want to stay on Earth. I want to take you on a bit of a journey of the solar system. And we'll start with the other planet in our solar system, which has a diffraction machine. So this is kind of cool. And it only happened a few years ago when the, uh, diff when the Curiosity rover landed on Mars. So um, hopefully you're all relatively aware of Curiosity. It's um, just absolutely amazing and it's got its, its you know, laser at the top here where it can zap uh, minerals but it also has um, a, you know, obviously amazing cameras in its arm and all sorts of things. And it's just beautiful for pictures being sent um, across the world. Um, but within the, buried within the body of this car-sized object, because there's a pe person, so um, Curiosity is big, is um, a sort of suitcase-sized instrument with a hole in the top. And this is um, a miniaturized diffraction machine. So just to, for example, the, the, one of the instruments I work in, so Echidna, that one that you just saw the animation of, is, um, well, it's about as tall as me. So it's a much bigger machine. And the fact that these, um, the being able to miniaturize a diffraction machine down into a suitcase is, was actually a big research effort by um, NASA and the, the ChemMin team themselves. And so I thought I'd show you a little bit about it. And it's actually been so successful that you can now go and buy one of these things. Um, so you can actually buy your own suitcase diffractometer. Um, this is my friend Sasha who's a lecturer down in Monash, and um, this is her diffractometer that she bought. He's called Terry. I, I named him. Um, <laughs> he's, he's, uh, the, 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 um, the, you can buy them from Olympus, and they're known as Terra diffractometers. So this is Terry the Terra. And it's really, really clever. That the idea is, so for instance, Sasha is an expert in metastable minerals. And she goes out into the field, and she'll dig up her mineral. Um, but by the time she's got it back to the lab, it would have transformed. With Terry, what she can do is actually look at the diffraction pattern and, and exactly where the atoms are in her sample while she's in the field. So it's absolutely invaluable, and that's exactly what um, Curiosity is doing. Now, um, as I said, there's about 20 years of research to get to this point to, of engineering research and of, of, sort of optimizing um, various sort of diffraction things. And one of the cool, and, and obviously I'm not going to do justice to that 20 years of work just here, but one of the cool things that I wanted to talk about was how they do their sample holders. So you, often when you collect a fraction data, you want to move your sample a little bit, especially if it's powdered a fraction, so uh, well, even if it's single crystal, because you want to be able to satisfy all the Bragg laws, because what you're looking at is the planes of atoms. So if you turn the sample, you're going to satisfy the Bragg's law, get better data. Um, what they did um, in space, uh, moving parts are bad. Moving parts can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And so what they wanted to do was to find a way of being able to minimize the moving parts, of, especially of the sample area. And this is what they came up with. So this little thing here, this is a tuning fork, believe it or not. So that hole that was on the top of, Curi of Kenmin, the Curiosity has its robot arm. It's able to scoop stuff up and down the hole. Oh, yeah, okay, okay. And then the material comes down here, 
and it goes into a hole in the top here and then falls into this window. And then here you can see there's a little motor here that sort of bangs back and forwards. And that means this whole thing, which is like a tuning fork, can vibrate. Hmm. And the sample could wiggle around in the middle, which is really great. So it's a really simple thing that happens. But it also, it's nice, because every time Curiosity is collecting diffraction data, it's doing the same as I do in the lab. And it's humming to itself. <laughs> kind of cute. It's kind of content. So this is the sort of data. In fact, this is the first diffraction pattern ever collected on another planet. So it's an absolutely amazing achievement. You can see, actually, and I'll, I'll tell you a little story that um, Dave Bish, who's one of the team of uh, in the in the Kenmin team, um, told told me was that you can see. So what we like to do when we put a diffractometer is we like to put a beam stop, and that actually stops the direct beam from coming all the way through. Because you can imagine the direct beam of X-rays is much brighter than anything we'll get from diffraction. So these are the cones of diffractions from all of the um, planes of atoms coming out here. Um, and you can see it's actually off a little bit. Now, have any of you seen that seven minutes of terror video about Curiosity um, landing? Yes. Yes, yes. OK. If you haven't, I really recommend going and seeing it. And so you can see that the way Curiosity landed, it was actually sort of flung out, and then it had a little ro um, a little um, sort of robotic arm sort of lowered it down and things. So it, it, it was quite a violent landing. Um, interestingly, this beam stop was nudged out of the way even before then. They actually knew before it even took off. So it packaged up. It was sitting on the launch pad at um, Kennedy Space Center, and they were running some checks on it, and they found that it was off but that little bit. Now, it took four months to package Curiosity up, and the, the Kenmin team went, oh, can we just get in there and just nudge it a little bit? And the engineers were like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they've just had to deal with it. Um, so that just sort of shows you that even in space, uh, well, even in space, things don't always go to plan. So what does that actually mean? What does that pattern actually mean? So this is how we analyze these patterns. This is actually this pattern at the bottom is that pattern that um, in the previous slide. But what we've done is we've integrated around the circle, and so you can see this peak here, for instance. And I've sort of oh, where am I going? Let's go back here. Um, is this broad peak here just to give you a bit of scale? Um, and um, what we can do is we. Um, because crystallographers, we like to simplify things as much as possible. So putting things down into a, 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 an XY plot is a little bit easier to model. And what we can do is we can model uh, mixtures of minerals we know that we know the crystal structures of and try and fit them to the data and see how they might have shifted. Now, interestingly, you can see that here is another pattern above. And it looks very similar, doesn't it? I mean, I, hopefully I can convince you of this. And in fact, I've zoomed in on a little bit here where you can see how similar those patterns are. Uh, so how have I, and I took this pattern, managed to get something that was just like Mars? Um, well, I got it from here. This is the Krafta volcanic region up in, uh, in Iceland. And, um, and this is probably one of the closest analogues that we have to that part of, of, of Mars, sort of basaltic lava flow. And so you can see that, that now we know this, we have a great um, sort of positioning, we say we can know that Mars is a lot like this area of, of Iceland, and in fact, it's also been compared to areas of Hawaii too. Um, we know a lot about those regions. We've studied them for hundreds of years. Well, the Vikings have studied Iceland for thousands of years. And so we can take all of that knowledge and we can transport it straight onto Mars. So that's um, really quite a fantastic um, um, resource to be able to have. So I've told you a lot about Mars, and Mars is a lot like Earth. Um, we ought to go somewhere that's not like Earth. And um, I'm going to talk a bit about these guys. So um, we have in our solar system a bit of a suite of icy moons. And I should say that, in fact, I'll go backwards. You'll notice there's a bit of a change in our solar system. Um, between Mars and Jupiter, we go from these sort of little rocky planets, which are, you know have a bit of water, we're able to sort of we're able to live on, and other people and rovers are allowed to able to rove across. To suddenly these whopping great gas giants. What's changed is that around here, around five um, astronomical units in the solar system, that was known as the ice line, and that's in the sort of very early sort of proto solar system. And that was the point in the solar system that ice was able to freely condense. 
Now, what that meant is you got giant ice cores formed much very, very quickly. So literally, water ice cores, along with a few other volatiles. And they got so big that they were actually able to capture hydrogen and helium straight out of that cloud. And that meant that you were able to form Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So these guys sort of blew up like balloons from the gas that was available. Now, there was a little bit of material left over from that. And that's what's gone on to form this big suite of icy moons. And they're, they're kind of un, they're different to us in that their surfaces are not rock. They're all ice, ice, and other materials. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Europa, and I've, and I've sort of um, my work these days is trying to work out what those materials are. So I should probably tell you how we know anything about those materials because we don't have any rovers trundling along the surface, unfortunately, and we don't have any diffractometers on there, so we don't know exactly what those materials are. And um, for that, I'll talk. Um, the, an example of how we've done that is um, through uh, missions like the Galileo spacecraft. So this is this is Galileo, um, um, and it was. And I, I people don't like me saying this, but it was a bit of a disaster. I didn't realise how much of a disaster it was. Unfortunately, it was all packaged up to go into space, and then there was I think it was the Challenger space shuttle disaster, and so Galileo actually stayed in storage for much longer than it should have done. And when it was um, launched, um, this big antenna here had actually rusted up, Ooh. and it never opened, it never fully opened. So luckily they had a backup antenna, um, but they weren't ever able to get all of the data that they, they anticipated off of it. So that's kind of one little bit of a shame. The other thing that went a bit wrong, and I think it's this instrument, was the magnetometer. And nobody had really thought about what well, no, no one had ever been to measure it before, but the magnetic field of Jupiter is ferocious. It's, it's massive too. If we could see it in the sky, it would be bigger than the sun. Mm. It's absolutely massive and very, very powerful. And it actually fried this magnetometer before it got within 100,000 kilo 100, kilometers of Jupiter. <laughs> so they were unable to take the magnetic measurements that they planned on. And in fact, it's only now we have the Juno spacecraft about to arrive. Uh, Jupiter that we're going to be able to make those measurements. Luckily, um, and I'll talk a little bit about Cassini later, they sort of um, learnt a few lessons from Cassini. Now, there's a few instruments on there, but one of them, I think, in fact, I think it's this one, is the near IR, um, near infrared mapping spectrometer. And this was one of the instruments that sort of saved the mission, because Galileo, I should say, wasn't a disaster. It was an absolutely roaring success. It's how we know anything about the icy moons around Jupiter. And what um, this um, infrared mapping, uh, near infrared mapping spectrometer sort of looks back and it just analyzes the, 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 the light um, reflected off the surface from the sun. And actually, before it went, and I, I love this example, it actually turned back and looked at Australia. And um, this is, you can just about see, they put the white line on here, and I had to add Tasmania because NASA hadn't put it on, and the Tasmanians get particularly grumpy if they get left off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll point out. Um, one little feature here is this thing up here. Anyone going to have a guess as to what that is? It's a coral reef. Coral reef? It is, exactly. Bingo. This is the Great Barrier Reef, the largest living organism on Earth. Um, and um, this is Galileo seeing the uh, Great Barrier Reef from 50,000 kilometers. So that's pretty impressive. So what it's doing is what it's able to see. So you could see the difference from the the the, the blue is sort of the sea type area, the the yellow being the land area, and then of course this it's picking up the car calcium carbonate in the coral. So it's really really cool. From that light, you can get an idea of the chemistry on the surface. So that's fifty thousand kilometers. Um, the the um, Galileo spacecraft actually passed within, I think the closest approach was 120 kilometers of the surface of Europa, which is one of those icy moons. And so you can imagine how many more details that, that they got. And so this is an example. So each of those pixels um, um, in that picture that I showed before can be, be um, plotted as a sort of a, a wave, as a, as a plot like this in very, in, with relation to wavelength. And this is the dotted line are the observed data from 
from from a particular point in Europa. And then the black point, the black data is a fit, and it's a fit of a mixture of ice and a material known as sulfuric acid hydrate. And so this is how I sort of go about and do my science, is that um, I look at these data and I read these excellent papers that people write about what sort of materials could be there. I then go to the laboratory and I mix up sulfuric acid and, I, and water and I try and work out exactly what crystal structures are there. Now I was slightly surprised because um, this is work I did a couple of years ago. Um, because we thought we knew all the hydrates. In fact, the last sulfuric acid hydrate to be discovered was discovered in 1913. Um, I was kind of surprised. You see those little stars? This is my diffraction pattern. So this is just like that diffraction pattern we took from Mars. Those little stars represent a material that we didn't know. It wasn't in the literature. It was a brand new material. Now, what I was able to do is change around with the, the proportions of the material I looked at and um, I'm able from this information to solve exactly where the atoms are. And so this is the material, it's a sulfuric acid hexahydrate. So you've got um, six water molecules for every sulfate molecule. Now the great thing about this is that the crystal structure gives us lots of information, for instance how strong they are, how they expand with heat. We can also give it to our, our friendly theoretical people and they can tell us things like how strong it is and how they would interact together. And this means that we can then feed this back and understand the surface a little bit more. Um, one particular cool thing here is that you see these, I've drawn in some of the they're not bonds so much, they're hydrogen bonds. So this is the layers of water, actually forms sort of almost ice-like layers through the structure. But there's areas, um, other bits in the structure that are further away from those areas, those layers. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. And this means this material is a bit like a clay. It's a bit of a, a layered material. And so that actually means that along a couple of directions it's very strong, but along the sea direction, along this direction, it's actually quite weak. These layers are able to slip past each other. And so that gives a mechanism because ice is actually really strong, just pure water ice. And that gives a weakness that you can then form all these incredible um, features that we see on the surface of Europa. So that's exactly, basically what I'm trying to do. Now, I'm quite conscious that 2013 is a while ago now, so I thought I'd talk a little bit more about something I've done a little bit more recently. And for that, I've zoomed a little bit further out the solar system to Titan. So Titan um, was the biggest moon in the solar system, um, hence one of the reasons it was called Titan. But actually, when we got there with the Cassini spacecraft, um, they realised that actually a lot of what we'd measured as planet was the atmosphere. The atmosphere of Titan is very big. And actually Ganymede is bigger, um, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, is bigger than it than 50 kilometres. So Titan lost out in that respect. But Titan is a really, really, well, for want of a better word, Earth-like moon. We see in the surface, and this is a, we can't see through the atmosphere uh, with visible light. We have to use radar because the clouds and the haze is too thick. But you can see things, and, and, and this is only one example of, material, uh, of things that look like Earth. Of course, the biggest, in fact for me, probably the most exciting thing in planetary science of late has been the discovery that there's water, well, there's, sorry, not water, there's liquid on the surface of Titan. So Titan is the first body apart from um, Earth the where we can see bodies of liquid on the surface. And then, so we've not only got these lakes and these seas, we've got little rivers and tributaries, but um, this one that um, I've been focusing on is these little lakes that have dried out, these dried out lake beds. And in fact, here is sort of these little dry, dried out lake beds, and here is a picture I took while flying across Australia a few months ago. And here are other dried out lake beds. So you can see they're very Earth-like in the way they're formed. Now, the big difference is surface temperature here well, this is the middle of the desert, so, oh, hang on, I'm going to get in trouble here because I'm going to say it in degree centigrade because um, I have no idea about Fahrenheit, but it's around 40 degrees centigrade on the, oh. on the surface here. And then um, it's pretty hot, um, whereas the surface of, um, of Titan is around minus 180 degrees centigrade. So whatever's liquid here and whatever is evaporating can't be water. Water is entirely frozen at these points. So there's something else that's driving this, for want of a better word, hydrological cycle on Titan. And this is something that um, 
that basically is building up as a as a theory into in our understanding of Titan that there is a hydrological cycle, but it's not of water. It's of small hydrocarbons, things like methane and ethane. Um, we're less sure about the cryovolcanic stuff. We've actually yet to see a volcano on the surface of, of Titan. So this stuff, I should put a big question mark over this a little bit. But we do see the lakes, and we have seen clouds, and we do think we've seen rain. So there's a cycle going there. But of course, these materials are a bit alien to what we're used to. We're very used to um, uh, water doing this role. So there's been a big study now um, with people like um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in to try and work out what materials are forming these. What what could these evaporites be? What could basically evaporate off of methane and ethane and leave behind a solid residue? Um, so they, they had started doing some experiments and they're taking lots of materials. Um, so they've taken a bit of ethane. Another one they took was benzene. Um, benzene's quite interesting. Um, so you know that um, with Titan, we've actually landed something on Titan. We landed the Huygens um, uh, probe on Titan. And one of the things it saw as it, it hit the ground is it saw a spike in benzene. So we were pretty confident that there's benzene on the surface. Benzene's a, a really cool material, but it, it freezes at around around minus 5 degrees C, and uh, you get these lovely little crystals. Now, what the guys at JPL realized that um, when you introduce liquid ethane, because um, ethane's liquid down to quite cold temperatures, you see there's quite a big change. The, the crystals pretty much all break up. They all get eaten up. Um, they feel, well, hang on, something's happened here. Now, um, they didn't quite know what had happened, they'd started to look with a bit of spectroscopy, but what they really needed was some good old-fashioned diffraction um, mm. to be able to tell them exactly where those atoms are. So um, they came to visit us here in Australia at the Australian Synchrotron, and we did that experiment. So exactly these two pictures are those two, two um, photographs, but in, in through the eyes of diffraction. This is your benzene, so here's your couple of benzene peaks here, so it's a nice, simple crystal structure. And when you introduce the ethane, and in fact we cool down to 90 Kelvin because that's the surface temperature, so that's the minus 180 degrees C at the surface of Titan, we get a brand new crystal structure. And in fact, you can see it's very different from this pattern. Hopefully that's not too, bad, um, too hard to see. But the thing that really got me, which... I, I got very excited about was this peak because this peak is at much lower angles. So it means it's a bigger structure than the benzene. So it means it's more complicated. So it means something has interacted, something has got into the crystal structure there. And here is an example of that crystal structure. So from this pattern, I was able to work um, work out where the atoms are. And I've just shown a little bit of it. And these are the lovely cuddly benzene atoms. And they form like a ring. And then the ethane sit down in the middle, so you get like this little channels of ethane through the structure. It's a really quite lovely um, potential evaporate structure because you've got a really nice channel that the ethane could evaporate in and out of as well. So um, that's, that's pretty exciting and we think that this is probably only going to be the first material because it turns out there's not much water ice on the surface of um, Titan. It's actually probably more likely all these hydrocarbons and so we need to start understanding this rather than chemists who have studied all of these materials before now, we need to start understanding these materials through the eyes of a, a mineralogist or a geologist and working out how strong they are and, and what um, and how they're going to respond to different um, stresses and things. And, and then hopefully that means we can interpret how the whole of Titan's surface has evolved. So this is just sort of one clue. This is potentially what's sat in those lake beds, those dried lake beds. But uh, I think we've got a lot more to go now. Okay, so let's zoom a bit further out. Um, I've talked a little bit about a terrestrial planet. So I've talked about Mars, which is obviously very much like here on Earth. Um, I've talked about the icy moons, um, and they're sort of, in terms of conditions, they're very cold, but they're not very extreme in terms of our understanding of extreme conditions. So I thought I'd talk about um, one big volume of stuff in the solar system that I haven't really talked about so far is inside these monsters, inside Jupiter's Saturn and Uranus. Now, I'm not going to lie to you, and this is probably a problem for you guys for the future, we can't really make the, the conditions within the um, centre of Jupiter very easily. I think we can make them for like femtoseconds in like a, a free electron laser or a, a high-powered laser gun. I mean, those are incredibly cool experiments, um, 
but they're, they're kind of scary. We can't do it for very long. Um, and same with Saturn. We, we just can't get to the pressures, so terapascals of pressures and, and 10,000 kelvins. And so we can't really understand the solid material going on in Jupiter and Saturn just yet. But we're working on it, and I'm sure you guys will probably be working on it. We can start to begin to get into the, 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 the interiors of, of, of planets like Uranus and Neptune. And that's what I'll talk about now. So Uranus and Neptune are pretty cool. They're... Um, a little bit different in their chemical makeup from Jupiter and Saturn. They're uh, they're more icy. They're known as the ice giant, gas giants. There's more water, methane, and ammonia, whereas um, Jupiter and Saturn are thought to be more hydrogen and helium. So Neptune's relatively conventional, but Uranus is very unconventional, especially in the way it rotates. It actually it's sort of it's almost like it had two good a time at a party and there's lollops over on its side and so I'm just flopping itself over. Um, so that that's pretty weird. Um, but then like Neptune, it also has a very weird magnetic field. Yeah, so the magnetic fields are not actually um, the magnetic field of Earth is actually right in the core of Earth. It's so right in the center. That's where the center of it is. With Jupiter and uh, sorry, Neptune and Uranus. They're off axis, so they're over here somewhere. So not only have you a whole planet where the rotation axis is sort of wonky, but the um, magnetic field is is completely wonky as well. So it's kind of unusual, and this has started to give people a clue as to what might be going on in the centre. So the thing the thought is that the magnetic field is not coming from the very center up in here. It's actually being generated in what's known as the icy mantle, this large region of the interior of, 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 Neptune, of Uranus and Neptune, which is mainly made out of things like water, ammonia, and methane, but at horrendous pressures and temperatures. You can see the top of this layer starts at around 2,000 Kelvin and 10 gigapascals. But the good thing is we can make these conditions in the laboratory and we can start to actually study these materials. We have to be a bit picky about our questions. We can't just solve the whole interior just yet. But one day we will. Um, but for instance, one particular question that um, I worked with a friend on is that when Voyager went past, they actually, which is the only fly past by the by by that we have of Uranus and Neptune, it um, observed how much xenon there was. So that's one of those elements back on that periodic table. And it noticed there wasn't enough xenon in the atmosphere of Uranus and Neptune to explain the sort of solar abundance. There just wasn't enough there. So I've got a, a colleague of mine had thought, hang on, under these really high conditions, these really big, high pressure, high temperature conditions. Could xenon actually have interacted with, uh, with water, perhaps, and uh, formed a material that means the xenon is now locked up in the interior here rather than out in the atmosphere. So that's, that was her hypothesis. She did have a bit of basis for this because she's seen something similar on the Earth. So how do we actually make these conditions in the laboratory? Well, um, this is where the synchrotron um, um, really comes into its own because you're able to get these really tiny x-ray beams that can focus on these tiny samples. So here is the sample chamber. So we use diamonds because they're, they're the strongest thing known to, to humankind. And you can and they're for, for scientific equipment, relatively cheap. So you take your normal diamond, so usually you would have your diamond in your ring, and then you turn it on its side and then you use this sort of culet area you then make a metal gasket and then you draw, drill a tiny hole in the metal gasket and that holds in your sample. So here for scale, this here is my little finger. <laughs> and here is where the sample goes there. Whoops, uh, it says I want to zoom in, but it's there, it's tidy. And this is the in where the um, diamond will sit as well. So you have one of those either side. And this is super tough <laughs> that we use to um, hold everything in. So inside here, we put a little bubble of xenon. We put a little bit of platinum. And I'll talk about why we put the platinum in. And then we fill the whole thing with water. 
And then we compress the whole thing to 50 gigapascals. So here is looking down the cell. So there's the whole of the cell. And this is looking through the diamond here. And uh, see everything. Here. And then we compress just by doing up some Allen keys there. So just by doing up some screws. I, I Hopefully, you saw pictures of me. I'm not that strong. But I'm able to do 50 gigapascals without too much trouble. So then we're able to put x-rays through the sample. And we get diffraction now. So that means we can say about the atoms and where they are. But we're also able to put lasers in there, um, which heat up the sample. And that's what the platinum's there for. The platinum's there for two reasons. One, it's a pressure marker. So we know what pressures we're at. But the other thing is it absorbs the energy from the laser. So I'll just talk you through that experiment that we did. So this is the first pattern. We're at 1,200 Kelvin. So we're just warming up. Here is xenon, sat here, relatively happy. Here is the platinum peaks. There's another one. And here are the ice peaks. At this pressure, ice is actually a bit of a weird material. It's, it's not um, hexagonal, so it doesn't form six-fold six snowflakes. It's, it's cubic. So it would form four folds, no folds. So. Um, but then you can see, as we warmed up, we got to 1,600 Kelvin, so pretty hot on the laser. And there was um, a bit of a change. Um, and you can see we've got these brand new peaks arriving here. So these ones we've, I've, I've, I've symbolized in the red there. Um, and we actually have two new peaks of material. So here's still the platinum. And this other material. Is new. The other really cool thing about this material, ooh, okay. <laughs> it's, when, it's when we um, when we turn off the laser, we go instantly down to room temperature, and that material is still there. So it's still just about there, but this one disappears. <laughs> So from this information, and I'm not going to lie to you, that is not enough information to make a crystal structure from. That is pretty challenging. So we um, we got a, um, got some theor theorist friends involved, and they they really helped out with this. But we got this very strange structure. It was xenon, and here are the water atoms. Um, it's a xenon hydrate, um, which sort of had, had never really been observed in it quite that point before. And so this is could be locking up the xenon in the center of those planets in both Uranus and Neptune. This uh, round circle material, so this one and this one, we think was a platinum hydride. We thought the hydrogen that was escaping interacted with the platinum and formed a platinum hydride very briefly, but that wasn't stable at lower temperature. So, so that sort of brings me a bit to the end of the solar system, giving you a bit of an overview of of how we know anything about the materials there and some of the future questions that we have. Um, one of the things I love about being a planetary scientist is that it's an ever-growing field. Um, that's even more so this year, where um, obviously New Horizons went past Pluto. And uh, we're able to see, I mean, Pluto, I think, is... I think a lot of people hoped it was going to be these interesting, but I don't think anybody realized quite how interesting it was going to be. In particular, is this area, this, this area here, the, the, the top of Sputnik Platinum, I think I call it, where you have flows of material that we think is, um, that they think is nitrogen and methane flowing across the surface, and then you have great ice mountains. And actually knowing something about the crystal structure can tell you why ice, because of the hydrogen bond being so strong at that point, can build 3,000 meter mountains, but why nitrogen and methane, which in their solid form are actually sort of, they don't, the molecules don't bond together, they just sort of float next to each other, and that means they don't have any strength, which, which is why that even at 44 Kelvin, they can flow across um, a fit, um, landscape. Um, for instance, um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but um, solid methane, which I've seen quite a lot of, it, it's more like jelly than anything. Or jello, sorry. Pretty cool. So, um, with that, I'll just acknowledge all the people that have helped um, and, and done 
helped and, and contributed to the science behind this, and also Carl, who's um, helped make the presentation look so brilliant. And thank you guys for listening. And I'll, I'll take it off uh, screen share. You can talk to me. Okay. Let's find our speaker. All right, I'm going to hit the last. You guys have any questions? Um, I have a question, actually, just more of a clarification. So, you were talking about the process in which you take basically from the correct spectra from these uh, spacecraft that are taking pictures and then you recreate the material that you see from the spectra and then you just that. And is, is, that's the process. And then, uh, and then is that the trade of the that? And that's how you're going to use the next step and step from Pluto as far as that goes. You got spectrum coming down and doing that if you're trying to create the step or something. Hang on, I'll just make sure I heard the question, okay? You want to clarify that I take the space based spectra um, as the way of informing what the chemistry is, and that informs what experiments I do um, here on Earth. Is that right? Yeah, the, oh, yeah. the clarification, making sure that was what was going on, yeah. Oh yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. And actually, one of the things that I'm trying to do a bit more now of is that um, there's been a lot of lab-based spectra. So usually, all of these hydrates, for instance, they compare, they, they have, for instance, at JPL, they have these massive vacuum vessels that they use to, um, to recreate the conditions. Now, the thing I've realized is they don't actually know what crystal structures are going on when they look there. And, and actually, the hydrates, it depends very much what pressure to temperature part, what you get in terms of crystal structures and, and minerals. So what I've realized is what we need is the ability to do diffraction and the mirror at the same time. And so that would really tie things up. So that's what I'm now doing in my lab here. That's awesome. Isn't that very cool? That's very interesting. Do we have any questions from our uh, friends there in Boston? You guys have? I have a question. Um, I guess what would be by um, putting a probe or, or something in orbit around Europa or Titan, um, how much would that help you, like with the current technology, how much would that help? Uh, to determine the makeup of the surface, makeup underneath, compared to what we have now? Like, how much more would um, we find out by putting something there? Um, quite a lot, actually. Um, if you think about the Galileo, so most of what we know about Europa has come from Galileo. So that was designed in the late 80s. And you just think about how like mobile phone technology has come on from the 80s. And this, the same for spectra and, and for spectrometers and diffractometers, um, especially spectrometers. So um, if we got there now, a, well, for instance, they are planning a new, a new Europa mission. And that would just give us pictures and spectra beyond our wildest dreams in terms of high resolution. The, the, the thing is now that the spectroscopy's got so good that they're actually now, all of the recent papers about the surface of Europa have come from Earth-based telescopes. So um, uh, the Keck telescope and the, uh, has done a lot of this work. In fact, so you maybe saw there was a... Oh, I can't think of the people who've been doing it, but but basically these telescopes have got such high resolution different um, spectrometers on them that even with Earth and the fact that you only get big splodgy pixels, you know, um, Europa fills maybe three pixels in total because it's so small. That is giving us better, as good data as we got from Galileo. I mean, it's messier and it's over a wider range. So you can imagine that if we actually got there now in orbit, we'd be able to tell much better. It, it'd just be incredible, just from the advantage of technology. But there's also new instruments coming online. Um, a really cool one I, I saw a presentation of, and that's being used on Rosetta, and they're planning to use in the new Europa mission, is the sub-millimeter range. And they've only just realized how powerful the sub-millimeter range, so it's very close to radio telescope, has for looking at water. For instance, I think I heard the quote that Rosetta, this, this instrument on Rosetta, it's called Milo, 
it um, can detect a water particle at around a thousand kilometers, one single water particle. It's that sensitive. So you can, I think we're only really just exploring what we can do now. And, and because we already have a bit of an idea of what's there, then that's better. Titan is a little bit of a different example because um, we don't know so much about the spectra of Titan because we can't see, we've only got so many windows through that hazy atmosphere. Like we can't see visually, we've only got a few bands that we can see through. So really with Titan, we really need to send something down there. A little rover or maybe a boat or a submarine <laughs> to, to, to wiggle on the surface, that, that would be awesome. So hopefully. <laughs> wow. Any other questions? All right, Lucas. Uh, another question. And so you mentioned that the difference in the, was making the technology for the Mars, uh, uh, basically, it's back, uh, diffraction being so small. Mm -hmm. What would be the uh, advantage of put or like say with the, all the colonization on Mars and putting like at full size actual uh, diffraction pattern there? Like, what, what would be? I mean, obviously, it would just be a larger. More yeah. Nice image, but like, do you think we'd see anything drastically more important? I would say probably not at this point. I mean, barring putting a synchrotron on Mars, you know, <laughs> it would be better. And so, certainly, you can imagine that in future when we have, I'm going to be hopeful when we have astronauts <laughs> probing along on the surface of Mars, they might have those little suitcase terrors. With them and be able to do something. Probably more likely they'll have one in a laboratory base at the back, you know, back at base that they'll be able to do stuff with. So, or, or maybe one within a rover. Um, the the Kenmin instrument is pretty top notch in terms of that little detector. It, it can go down to um, really low um, 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 D spacing. So they optimized it to look for clays. And uh, I don't know if you remember, we, there was a peak really, of high despacing. That high despacing is that big inter distance between the clays where you can shove lots of stuff in between. Um, so they sort of, again, that was designed because of all the previous information we have from Mars was people beginning to excite about the possibility of clays. And Ken Min has been able to show, yep, there's clays. Now the problem with clays is they're actually really tricky to study because they're platy and uh, they have preferred orientation, and they're never particularly nice diffraction patterns. So it's good that Curiosity has um, a ton of things. It's not just the diffraction, it's got the spectroscopy, it's got its ChemCam laser, it's all sorts of things that it can throw at it. So um, ChemMin in that sense is only part of the picture. Cool. So what, what advice would you give uh, young people now? If you could talk to yourself back when you were an undergrad, yeah. you, you could tell these guys and these, these young students here. What, what advice would you give current undergraduates? Um, I, I would just keep doing what you enjoy. Um, someone told me when I started when I chose my undergrad, so I, I say, um, as, as Will said, I did um, planetary science as my as my undergraduate major. It's a little bit different in the UK to um, the states, so I understand. But um, they, I was swithering between geophysics and um, planetary science. The, the the rational part of my brain was like, I should do geophysics because I could get a job. Hmm. But um, which is a good rationale to have. <laughs> um, if, um, but somebody said to me, look, you know, you've got to, for a year undergrad, you've got to do something you enjoy. And I was like, okay, okay. And so that's where planetary science, that had come on and I was like, oh, I really, really want to do that. So, and and I, I did all right, at, I did really well at it. So, and a part of that was because I enjoyed it. At the end of it, I was quite aware that I needed to learn a technique. I needed to learn a skill. So planetary scientists, I suppose the same with physicists. A relatively broad um, education at the end of it, and you need to find something that you really like, that really that you want to specialise a little bit and kind of own a little bit more. So I suppose that's the thing: as you go through your degree, um, I would maybe think about what technique am I enjoying? Am I enjoying the theoretical part of it a little bit more? Am I enjoying the experimental part? 
For me, it was the discovery of diffraction and crystallography. I, I, it was actually, the first thing I ever diffracted on was of clays. And we did this experiment where we put water in and this clay sort of swelled up. And then the clay, and then we dehydrated and the, swell, the clay went down. And it's a very simple thing. But it was like, wow, I can see this. I can quantify this. I can see how this is useful. Mm. And so then I picked my PhD in order to develop those diffraction skills and to do more of that. In fact, to do specifically the high pressure diffraction, which was really interesting to me at the time. So I suppose that's the thing, sort of uh, find something that you really like and sort of try, you know, get good at it. And then you can use that skill. The great thing about diffraction is then and I think that's the case with any technique, you then can apply it to lots of different um, studies. The other good thing is that like, even um, outside of academia within industry, most things have an application, or even that just that ability to analyze data, rationalize the input, and tell someone else about it is an incredibly useful skill that, that many people will value. Mm -hmm. So do you mostly do work there on uh, planetary science uh, experiments, or do you also do some industry-related uh, projects? Um, so I've got a really cool job. Um, so I'm, as I say, I'm an instrument scientist, so I'm a little bit different from a, a professor or a lecturer. Um, I work at a national facility where we run various instruments, diffraction instruments, and we have small angle, triple axis, all sorts of instruments. Um, we run them for the broader community. Um, not just Australia, we have a lot of international users as well. And so that's really fun. There's always something different going on. So 30% of my job is running those experiments day to day. I have you know, new scientists coming through. They sit me down and they go, right, I want to try this. And I'll be like, ooh. Okay, yeah, or, oh gosh, this is going to be terrible. <laughs> Sometimes there's a bit of that. 30% um, uh, of my job is, is um, repairing the instrument. Um, but not just repairing, extending it, trying new things, you know, a little bit of calibration and stuff. So it's a bit of instrument-based sort of work. Um, and in that I actually fold a bit of my planetary science work. So at the moment I'm really working on getting high pressure on the instrument because we've not done it so much. And so that's complementary. That will help the users, you know, the, the general community that can come and do these experiments, but it'll also help me because I can do my experiments. <laughs> and then the other 30% of my time is my research, is the, the work I do. So at the moment I'm I'm sort of a bit all over the solar system, but I'm trying to um, zone in on Titan. Um, I have, um, I'm part of a, a solar systems working proposal grant um, based at JPL and we're going to start trying to find more of those Titan materials and then the plan, hopefully the next grant, is to work out how strong are they? Mm -hmm. uh, can we start doing crazy experiments where we form them and we compress them and do other things? So um, I think that's the next 20 years of my career mapped out for me. <laughs> How did you end up in Australia? What what was the was it the job just opened and you jumped and got it and just went with it? How did that work? How did that happen? Pretty much. I mean, at the end of my um, PhD, uh, I really enjoyed doing the PhD, but I kind of knew I wanted to work in a central facility. Mm -hmm. I wanted to try work in a synchrotron or a neutron facility. And so I kind of looked for postdocs in that area. The other nice thing is that um, there are these facilities around the world. I mentioned a few in, in America. Um, and the Australian synchrotron had opened up. It was only seven years old. so. And they started the postdoc program, so I actually moved. Uh, I applied for that and and got got that position, and so that was four years ago. And I lived in Melbourne for two years, and then um, and then the position up in Sydney opened, and I I got that as well. So um, went from X-rays back to neutrons, but uh, that's kind of the thing. Um, and so it's slightly. Um, to the one side, this sort of career path of being an instrument or beamline scientist, but there's there's a few of us out there, and and the amount of facilities is only growing. And um, uh, Japan has oh, so many synchrotron, it's untrue, and very very cool neutron facilities there. Um, India are growing, they're uh, building their own um, 
um, super APS style synchrotron. Um, you have ones in the UK. Uh, Africa is starting to think about building their own one as well. Um, so they're really, really interesting um, um, in um, institutions, and there's a lot of overlap between what they do. So um, you, we often have meetings where we all get together with other instrument scientists and chat about the problems and things that we face and stuff. And it's, 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 it's an interesting field to be in. So that's sort of one of the reasons I wanted to be a scientist um, was that I really wanted to travel and to live elsewhere. I, I kind of cheated, I think, living in Australia because they speak the same language as me. And, and, and the culture is pretty similar, actually. I didn't realize how similar the culture would be until I got here. Um, but uh, they're a little bit more laid back than the Brits, though. <laughs> um, but I have spent I've spent three months in Japan last year, which was cool. So that's that's a big advantage of the the, the science lifestyle. It's it's not very secure for a long time. You're sort of bouncing around the world doing fun things, but you can either think of that as a really bad thing, or you can just think, all oh, right, you know, this is a good thing. I'm going to roll with it and go with it. So that's true. Uh, those were interesting tweets when you were uh, over in Japan. That was cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wow. So what what graduate programs at what institutions would be good places for students who might be interested in pursuing sort of the work that you do or to get into this sort of line of work? But what programs or what institutions should students look into? Uh, okay. I'm not sure about programs specifically, but in terms of schools, mm -hmm. you have um, Caltech. Uh, mm -hmm. So basically, look for where the NASA labs are, and okay. then see the, the, the. So Caltech is obviously is what JPL blossomed out of, and mm -hmm. they still have very strong connections. So part of the, the the team I'm working with at JPL also have positions at Caltech, and they wiggle back and forwards. And um, there's University of Arizona have an incredibly big planetary science program. Um, Southwest Institute, where is that? Is that an uh, institute in itself? Um, that's near Colorado, I think. So Colorado has another big... Um, there are There's various centers of, of planetary science around, and as I say, they're usually associated with um, NASA labs. There's also a lot of the NASA labs have... Um, summer intern programs. Mm -hmm. For instance, I know that the Lunar and Planetary Institute has a very successful summer intern program. So that's something else you guys can have a look at as well if you're interested. Um, again, as I say, there's not so much to fraction so much. And if, if you wanted to learn to fraction, that's a whole different ball game of schools and things to go into. Um, and that is a little bit more common across um, things. But uh, planetary science, the, those few that I mentioned, and, and the NASA labs itself. I mean, NASA actually sponsor a grad school as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we try to encourage the students to apply for those summer internship programs because mm. it's a great opportunity to go visit some of these sites and do some of this real, real interesting work. So yeah. Did you do any of that when you were uh, an undergrad? No, I didn't. I'd say in the UK, we didn't have quite so much available to us. Um, so that there is that little bottleneck. Uh, the UK has come a long way in its planetary science. So we have the Open University and UCL are the two big centres, and then there's a few others around. So uh, with me, it was actually that's one of the reasons why I suppose I went into the high pressure diffraction. So I did a, a few um, courses at the central facilities and stuff, and I saw that. I could apply that work to a slightly different, you know, usually at central facilities, people are doing like fundamental physics or battery work or applied work. And, and for me, I was like, I could use this to do planetary science. So, uh, and that, that sometimes just being that little bit different to other people can be really advantageous. Um, but, um, but yeah, you know, so there wasn't so much for me available in that respect. And the same for the students in Australia is that the um, planetary science community is only recently, um, uh, was it agglomerated? I think is the right term or something. We're like a like a little proto solar nebula, and we're going to start to differentiate, and we're going to start to grow from here. Um, and hopefully that means there'll be more stuff going on because there there is some cool projects going on in Australia. 
This has been a fascinating seminar series to have so many interesting and different uh, projects that people are working on. It's just fascinating to see what's at the cutting edge. So uh, it's just great. It's really interesting. Do we have any, any other questions from our uh, folks here at uh, UCA or any of our uh, questions from our folks over at um, uh, Boston? Nope, we're good? Cool. Okay. We're well, you good? can always find me on my Twitter hashtag. <laughs> well, let's thank our speaker one more time. This has been awesome. Okay, well, thank you very much. I'll definitely send you a, a follow-up email later, uh, probably for you tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, for me tomorrow as well. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. It's great to No worries. Take all care. Right. Bye-bye. Nice Bye. to meet you all. Bye. <laughs> All right, bye-bye, guys. All right, thanks a lot. All right, thank you.